my name is Stephen Collins. I'm co-founder and CEO of Anor Corporation, and we're very excited to participate in today's Sandia National Laboratories CyberTech Day 2020 event. We're going to be specifically talking about the essential elements to create and deploy a secure, connected, and collaborative digital enterprise. This is something that we're very passionate about. We're going to divide today's conversation into two main parts. The first Part, I'm going to be providing some overview information and some insights and observations based on our work with many innovative manufacturing organizations as they pursue successful digital transformation strategies. We're going to be talking about the opportunities, some of the obstacles or potential pitfalls, as well as the ROI and performance benefits associated with successful digitalization. And then we're going to segue into a more informal fireside chat with Anarch CTO and EVP of Product Development, Scott Collins, where we're really going to drill down on the very important topic of cybersecurity as a major cornerstone for successful digitalization. We look forward to the conversation. To provide a little bit of background and context for how Anarch relates to this topic, I thought a brief company overview might be helpful for those of you who are not familiar with the company. Anarch is a leading provider of technical content management and visual collaboration software, and we empower digital transformation initiatives for leading OEMs and suppliers across the major uh, manufacturing sectors. Specifically, we help our customers by enabling them to generate and manage role-specific technical data packages, or TDPs, and connected digital workflows for more efficient, secure data access and collaboration along the digital thread. We're based here in Boulder, Colorado, where I'm speaking from. We have offices throughout North America and Bangalore, India, and a strong network of worldwide technology and integration partners to help our customers succeed. In today's rapidly changing, increasingly competitive environment, OEMs and their suppliers have really honed in on the fact that if they don't have a strong digital transformation and digitalization strategy, they're really not going to be able to remain and retain their competitive edge and advantages going into the 21st century. And within that realization, there's some serious, uh, important trends and opportunities that they're really focused on. Specifically, they're trying to improve quality, minimize waste, comply with regulations, and, and satisfy customer demand at a more rapid pace. And in order to do that, they're looking at digital transformation strategies that are built upon smart, connected, digital thread, digital twin, IoT, AI, AR, additive manufacturing, model-based enterprise processes and solutions. And, and in support of that, uh, the advent and the rise of, of capabilities in the realm of cloud, big data, mobile, and IoT are empowering or helping them empower smart, connected digitalization for more efficient, information-rich data sharing and collaboration throughout the enterprise, supply chain, and field service organizations. And what we're seeing, based on the customers we work with, as well as uh, surveying a larger band of industry participants, is that the innovative manufacturing organizations, both OEMs and supplier organizations, who really succeed in the effective implementation of solid digitalization strategy that spans the entire life cycle of their product and services are seeing tremendous ROI and performance benefits. They're typically coming to market faster with accelerated new product introduction times. They're seeing reductions in both uh, cost and time for both engineering, manufacturing, inspection time. They're seeing significant reduction in manufacturing, scrap, supplier rework, and their uh, supplier response times are accelerating significantly. So there's a real value in, in getting your digitalization strategy correct. The question is, why aren't more companies doing it and why aren't they doing it more effectively? there are some significant deployment challenges, and we're going to talk a little bit about those today as well as the, the potential solutions. So one thing is that customers, companies often struggle with uh, existing system functionality. There might be uh, limited uh, the gaps and limited interoperability, which stymies adoption. Uh, existing solutions for data sharing, collaboration, and visualization are often proprietary, rigid, ad hoc, and not really that well suited for modern web-based digital thread paradigm. Uh, customers are challenged with managing a wide array of disparate technical data types, file formats that are required to achieve enterprise digitalization. And then until recently, enterprise OEMs and their suppliers have been somewhat slow to implement public cloud strategies. We're starting to see that change, but that's definitely been um, a little bit of a detractor from really effective and efficient digitalization. And then finally, but it can't be, you know, last but not least, process and culture change is hard and it requires organizational commitment and alignment in order to be successful. So one of the main questions is, how do we help 
manufacturing organizations, OEMs and their supplier communities, as well as their field service partners, overcome some of these obstacles? How do we help them better manage their technical data and information and content to be able to deliver that information to the downstream consumers along the digital thread? Whether you're talking about engineering, supply chain, manufacturing, service, and so forth, Everyone along the digital thread and every one of those historic functional silos needs access to specialized information to be able to, one, uh, drive better decisions in real time, two, collaborate both within their organizations and, and parts of the business as well as with folks in other parts of the organization in order to, again, uh, drive better decision making, uh, provide managed data access, and, uh, and, and really be able to more effectively do their jobs in real time. So in order to do that, it's important to be able to harness all of the technical data and information and content that you need to be a part of your digitalization scheme and serve that up in the form of fit-for-purpose technical data packages uh, that can be provided in a manner that's uh, secure, connected, and accessible from virtually any device along the digital thread. And this is really where ANR comes into play. And what you're seeing here in this video that I'm showing is really some examples how the how these role-specific uh, technical data packages and workflows uh, help folks in supply chain, purchasing, manufacturing, and field service have access to the right information, the right place at the right time, but also have a connected and secure and traceable mechanism that's very easy to implement uh, to be able to communicate and collaborate with each other in a multi-directional fashion and to be able to provide that information in an in a intelligent data stream that makes its way ultimately back into the engineering function of the organization for quality improvement and, uh, and design improvement and so forth. And so this is not intended to be a sales pitch, but this is just showing how we help companies basically take any data from any source of, of virtually any kind and really deliver that up so it can be a central part of a organization's digitalization and content management scheme and providing that in a very uh, connected, secure, traceable, and intuitive, collaborative, uh, information-rich environment. And so uh, what we're finding is organizations, when they have this access and we make it this easy for them to bring this together, uh, what they're finding is they're in a much better position to realize many of the ROI benefits that we, uh, we talked about uh, just a few moments ago. One other critical component and foundational component of being able to provide access to the right information in the right place at the right time along the digital thread is embracing open standards. And we're seeing this is becoming increasingly important and, and that the companies that are really successfully uh, digitalizing are really understanding how they need to work with industry open standards uh, formats and and, uh, and schemas in order to be able to provide access independent of what kind of data systems they have in place. So most of the companies that we work with have multi-CAD, multi-PLM, multi-ERP, MES, uh, very uh, vibrant but complex heterogeneous data environments where the different authoritative data sources are generating uh, just such a myriad of, of different data types uh, that without the interoperability associated with and supported by open standards, it would be very difficult for them to be able to provide that fit-for-purpose uh, content and data access to uh, stakeholders along the digital thread. So Anarch is a cornerstone of its uh, platform and our approach with customers is that we're big believers and big supporters of open standards and our platform is designed to embrace open standards in order to be able to provide that interoperability and easy to manage data access that our customers uh, require to, to succeed. I'd like to wrap up today's brief discussion with a few conclusions and some food for thought. And, and the first one is that digitalization, digital transformation is hard and it requires organizational commitment uh, management support and team member alignment throughout in order to be successful. The second uh, thing that we've really observed time and time again is it's important for organizations to think about their objectives and their outcomes and their ideal processes first before making major investments in technology and solutions they're hoping will uh, help them uh, solve their problems. And then uh, no matter how you bring together your processes and your, your solutions, you want to make sure that your uh, facilitating and empowering connected and managed access to the right information in the right place at the right time, 
for successful enterprise-wide digitalization. And then with today's rapid uh, pace of change, um, it's really important that when you make your bets, both in terms of process as well as technology, that you're uh, adopting resilient, open, flexible platforms and applications and solutions that are going to keep up with that rapid, continuous pace of change. Uh, and that way, they'll keep pace with your digitalization initiatives as they evolve over time. Okay, well, hopefully that provided you all with some useful uh, information about your digitalization initiatives and food for thought. Now we're going to segue the conversation to really do a more deep dive on the very pressing topic of cybersecurity. And with me now, I'd like to introduce Scott Collins, CTO and EVP of Product Development. Uh, welcome, Scott. Really glad to, to join you in today's conversation. I think it's going to be a good one. Well, thanks, Steve. I'm, I'm happy to be here today. So the first question uh, that we we uh, we often hear is, uh, and we, I think is really an important starting point is, what are some of the bigger cybersecurity risks for collaboration across the supply chain, Scott? What are you what are you hearing from our customers, and and how do we uh, relate to that that issue? Well, we we all know that large companies and government organizations invest heavily in cybersecurity technology to thwart even the most sophisticated state actors. They've, they've built up these incredibly impressive defenses. Uh, we can call them castles, um, for lack of a better description, that include multiple active security elements with AI-based monitoring as well as you know, extensive security policies and training. So, you know, so far, so good. That's all great, uh, and it's all necessary. Um, but even after all that fortification, there's a weak link in the industrial complex. That's because modern supply chains often require that sensitive data is shared with third parties. Once the data exits the castle, the levels of protection often change. So instead of the castle's defenses, they have to rely on the security policies, procedures, and technologies deployed by their vendors. So the typical supply chain data leak scenario works something like this. A big company or a defense organization hands out critical intellectual property to a smaller vendor. Maybe this is for an ETO order, for a contract manufacturing services, or you know, maybe it's for maintenance contracts for field assets. The smaller vendor puts the files in a secure network share. They're still protected, but admittedly in a security framework that is less capable than the castle. Um, you know, the, then these smaller vendors are, are they become naturally, uh, because of the defenses of the castle, a, a popular target for sophisticated state actors. To make matters worse, the smaller vendors usually work with subcontractors. These are um, these sensitive files that went out to the, uh, to the initial tier one um, vendor um, sometimes find their way into subcontract the subcontractors' networks now with a set of new set of human and infrastructure risks that are even further removed from the castle. Uh, you know, and, and so this is this is a pervasive problem. Uh, some analyst uh, surveys conclude that up to eighty percent of organizations have experienced um, you know a data breach through this kind of vulnerability. That is what we call in the business uh, an elephant in the room. Scott, I think that's I think that's spot on the issues that you just highlighted. Um, to drill down a little bit more, another question that comes to mind is, how would you recommend businesses combat threats resulting from vulnerabilities exposed through uh, collaboration with their supply base? Many of the problems can be traced back to the very concept of files, like literally what a file is technologically. So if yeah. files, Files often grow legs. Once they walk out of a secure network and into the wild, you know, traceability may disappear, it often disappears. Um, you know, so we've been investing in technologies that provide secure, traceable content access for the supply chain without yeah. necessarily providing the files. So we, you know, we call this fileless web content, this concept of being able to provide the information, but you don't actually give the handout necessarily. Um, you know, by providing the fileless web content, you can better maintain the security of the information. Also, if you have to, prov if you have to provide files, uh, and that, that happens, right? Uh, we, we think that session-aware watermarking is a great deterrent. Our, our content management platform allows for content to be dynamically watermarked with user or organization identifying information, as well as all the normal distribution notices and release status info. So, you know, in other words, when content is viewed in the browser, it can be watermarked with session-aware information Likewise, when the underlying files are downloaded, uh, for example, PDF, they can also be watermarked with the same information that was seen in the user's browser. So, you know, that's, that's the, the, uh, the basic idea. 
That makes complete sense. Are there any other advantages that come to mind by utilizing a fileless web content approach? There are several several um, other advantages to using fileless web content. You know, one of the big advantages of using web content instead of files is that the information is streamed, allowing for use over spotty cellular networks, uh, mobile devices, and even wearable computers. So the you know the, the this is a, a type of technology that's designed to work in the field as well as the factory. Um, also, you know, our, our platform in particular supports a number of sophisticated technical data types like 3D CAD, drawings, schematics, as well as the more typical PDF-based documents. So using fileless web content for this type of information means that you don't have to use expensive file-based viewer applications. Instead, you can just use your secure browser, which is, that's pretty nice. Um, we also offer capabilities like fileless graphical collaboration and markup. Uh, as well as the creation of digital work instructions. And all this, what this does is it basically allows uh, supporting workflows to occur in the platform instead of resorting to file-based workflows where these could occur. So, you know, often these files will be downloaded and then they're going to create more derivative files. And, and during collaboration, you're going to email things. And, and anyway, you've got multiple points of possible egress for uh, this, this sensitive information. So by Allowing this fileless data to be marked up graphically, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, to support graphical collaboration, as well as all the sort of uh, important, the critical, uh, you know, work that has to occur with this data, you you really do uh, prevent uh, information leaks. To drill down a little bit further, based on your experience with many of our uh, major customers, what recommendations can you provide on how a company would redact data? Uh, in specific source files? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, and our customers do have, they have different, they implement different types of uh, strategies here. But um, I can't say for sophisticated technical data like 3D CAD, where some of the most sensitive data can appear, uh, yeah. we have a, we have a recipe based publishing services that allow the automatic redaction of sensitive IP. And that's, you know, of course, not having the data in the data that you hand out, uh, is, is one of the best ways to prevent that uh, from being um, uh, uh, leaked, right? So if it's not there, you know, the, the, the types, that type of information, 3D CAD and other types of technical data, um, they have many use cases, right? And one of them is, uh, one of them is in, uh, often in the supply chain, um, but there are others. And so being able to sort of parse the information and, and, and uh, you know, attenuate it as, as needed um, for different types of recipients is a really uh, a, an interesting uh, capability that we have. You know, and a great example of this of this uh, of this is the work that we're doing with uh, KCNSC. Uh, we just yeah. completed a study with their team where we validate their ability to redact specifically identified confidential information from the 3D CAD data. Ultimately, this is going to be provided to their external suppliers. So it's a uh, you know it's it, that's an exciting capability for for many of our customers. Uh, that, yeah, that's a great example. No, oh, that makes complete sense, and and I know our customers benefit from from those those practices. Um, another question that uh, that I think is interesting and is probably an important one to uh, to think about is is file oriented digital rights management or DRM and watermarking sufficient in terms of the protection it provides. Well, we think that the use of file-oriented DRM and watermarking should be considered a calculated risk. You know, sometimes it's impossible to work with a third-party supplier uh, without providing files. It's, it's, you know, a lot of cases it, 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 is, uh, it is impossible. So you're going to, to a limited extent, provide files. But more often than not, uh, it's straightforward to use fileless web content that's fully traceable instead. So ultimately, um, you know, limiting files from exiting the castle will significantly improve your supply chain cybersecurity. Absolutely. And the way that uh, most organizations, uh, and certainly we look at this, is that cybersecurity is best addressed with a layered approach. And with that in mind, uh, you know, do you see companies combining these different approaches? Are they favoring one approach over another, or does it really vary depending on the circumstances? Yeah, most most are combining approaches. So traditional supply chain information sharing sharing has always, you know, and for forever has been conducted with files. But in, you know, increasingly our customers like um, Boeing, GE, Lockheed Martin, and others are implementing a hybrid approach, including the use of session or watermarking information and web content, 
as well as on any files that are downloaded. So it is, it is definitely a hybrid approach. Uh, and I think that's the way that most companies look at this. You're really trying to, um, to be, you don't, you don't want to, you don't want to uh, forsake utility, um, but you do want to increase security. And so that's a, that's a calculation that they have to make. Can you, just to expand on this, can you provide uh, some insight as to why this is the case? Yeah, I, I think that ultimately the security reason for using fileless web content is to make, maintain information stewardship, right? I mean, that's, that's sort of yeah. the, the basic idea. If, if downloading is not provided, every access to the content through the web browser is logged with session level information for complete traceability. So that, I mean, that's, that's pretty solid. And, um, and you know, the, the, ultimately they don't end up on someone's uh, file share, even if it is behind a secure network. It, it doesn't leave your custody or stewardship. Um, you know, uh, if you're going to provide file downloads, on the other hand, uh, and that, again, most companies are going to do a hybrid approach, the reasons to use session-aware watermarking for both web content and for downloaded files is to apply vendor identifying information. In addition, and so you'll see right. a lot of customers providing watermarking with distribution notices, you know, uh, release status, all that good stuff, right? But they, they, they don't typically imprint the, the, the content that's being received by the recipient with the recipient's information. That's, that's not yeah. as common. Yeah. So we allow that to occur. Um, and in addition to informing the vendor of their personal role in maintaining security, I mean, they, you know, depending on how you do it, it could be uh, their company or it could be literally the user's credentials, if, if, if that's desirable. Um, you know, if there's ever a leak, that type of information can help trace the leak back to the source, right? right. That's, a, yeah. that's a kind of a key benefit. Okay, no, that's great. And then we have time for one, one final question. Um, that we'll, we'll leave everybody with is um, what are the major areas where you see companies taking advantage of fileless web content? Well, I, I, maybe I'll, I'll sort of parse this uh, question into two, two, well, two, into two aspects. Uh, you know, one, um, for, first of all, our area of, of customer focus and our software development, all the investments that we're making in our content platform are, targeting supply chain manufacturing and field service use cases. So that, that's where we, we, where we provide value to our customers. Um, you know, as we've discussed, one of the major areas where companies are taking advantage of fileless web content is, is uh, supply chain procurement. So specifically when you're exchanging sensitive information during RFX negotiation and the bidding process, as well as order to remittance where you're, you, know, you're, you may be um, executing a contract with your vendor and have an established relationship. That's a, a, a big focus for many of our customers, including uh, GE, for example. Um, another area of potential leaks is, is during field service maintenance and repair projects where technical information needs to be provided to vendors in order to, to service assets in the field. There's, there's often a surprising amount of sensitive information that can be found in field service technical content. This is uh, you know, information that percolates from, of course, from the work instructions related to servicing and maintaining these assets, but, but also, you know, some of the engineering data, the, the direct uh, original engineering data gets put into that information as well. And that environment, uh, for many reasons, uh, tends to be more casual from a security perspective. And so uh, it's an important area to seal up. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, I think we've, we've uh, um, run out of time to keep the conversation going, although I know we could spend more time talking about these very important topics related to cybersecurity. Um, and we would just a good good uh, um, point to, to just put out to the audience is that um, if you have any uh, need for follow-up information, we'd like to have a deeper conversation with Anarch, please uh, feel free to reach out to info at anarch.com or visit our website. We'd welcome the opportunity to have a conversation with you and find out more about what your needs are and to uh, uh, determine how we might be able to help you, um, you know, provide manage traceable data access and collaboration in a very secure context. So thanks for your time today. We really appreciate it. Scott, thanks for all the great insight. You spend so much time with our customers and it's great to be able to just share the, 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 the wisdom and the wealth of, of, uh, of information to, to a broader audience. So thanks very much. Oh, well, thank, thank you, Stephen. It's, it's my pleasure, of course.